Hello, and welcome to my talk on Massive MIMO Beam Management in sub six gigahertz 5G new radio. My name is Ryan Dreifurst, and I'm a PhD student at NC State, where I work on machine learning assisted signal processing and wireless communications. Today, I'll be presenting our joint work with Professor Robert Heath and Dr. Ali from Meta. So to get started, we're going to talk about Massive MIMO and really multi-antenna technologies in 5G. Um, we'll talk about the benefits and how 5G is attempting to enable larger antenna arrays. First of all, uh, in multi-antenna technologies, we get a number of different ways that we can improve the gain and the, the throughput of the system. The first two focus on improving the channel signal to noise ratio, or SNR. This includes the channel diversity gain and the directive beam gain, which work by getting different realizations of the channel and improving the, the cooperative beam forming effect of the antenna array. Now, these are, are positive solutions, but they actually improve the throughput as order of log n as opposed to spatial multiplexing, and especially spatial multiplexing across multiple users, uh, often termed MU MIMO, uh, where this actually provides gains on the order of, of n as opposed to log n. Now, these are some pretty significant benefits, but it requires perfect channel state information to truly achieve these results, uh, which is basically knowledge of the channel at both the transmitter and receiver. Now, 5G attempts to do this by doing a, a training progress or a training uh, system known as beam training, which looks like this. First, it starts with beam sweeping, where a number of SS blocks, which are uh, a, a defined training sequence, are transmitted with specific precoders uh, in different directions. Now, the UEs each will measure these various beams and determine which one is the strongest. It will then report back, along with some other information like the channel quality index and, and some other things, um, what, is, what, what was the strongest beam. Now, the issue is that this is actually a very uh, limited form of feedback, and uh, it, it doesn't necessarily provide a, a lot of information, especially depending on how the SS block or the SSB beams are decided. So ultimately, we can see that there are a number of challenges in this beam management framework uh, that really derive themselves from the way the codebook is used and integrated into the system for obtaining feedback, channel state information, and initial access. So in, in general, the beam code book really needs to be designed to take into account things like the user density and the channel properties to, to optimize for the best situation. Otherwise, you end up with either very large code books that require a lot of feedback in order to obtain a good link, or a small code book that doesn't end up providing very much information and does not initiate a strong link. So given all this, we're going to talk about how we set up the problem of initial access uh, and determining and designing the Beam codebook using machine learning to help improve it. First, we start with the received signal model. Now here, we start with a narrow band clustered channel model with a plane array of both sides, although this is more of a generalization. We'll actually, in simulation, use a uniform linear array at the receivers or the UEs. And then we conglomerate a number of factors such as transmit power, the gain factors, receive powers, all into this gamma bar. The idea here is that not all of the channels will have the same uh, power due to being closer or farther from the base station. So we don't want to abstract away and, and have a normalized channel necessarily, but we want to have something that we can apply to uh, shift to the overall SNR up and down um, for this investigation. Now, furthermore, it's important to note that this is what would be termed normally a broadcast channel, but in this case, we're calling it multicast to differentiate from the broadcast channel that is used in cellular systems. So normally, a broadcast channel implies uh, the same message is transmitted to all users. However, uh, oftentimes, the, the broadcast channel mentioned in cellular just means the downlink data transmission, um, which means different data for each user. So in this case, we're using multicast to refer to the situation where all users can receive the same SSBs because it's just a training sequence and does not need to be tuned for each user. Now, the goal is that each user can, can actually receive these at least one of these with a good signal. So ultimately, it comes down to this des the designing of this codebook, in this case, the SSB codebook, which is used for initial access, and has a very limited number of beams, which is LMAX. Now, in sub-6 gigahertz, it can be anywhere between 1 and 8, depending on your carrier frequency. Um, but altogether, even 8 beams is still a very limited number to attempt to uh, obtain significant channel state information. Now, at the UE, we're going to assume that it has a digital array that can perform maximum ratio combining. And it will receive each SSB interference-free 
due to the fact that the SSBs are transmitted time sequentially and far enough apart that there's no overlap. Thus, the RSRP of a given beam to a specific user can be given by this equation uh, for P of I here. Now, P of I is actually the RSRP, and this essentially makes up the channel quality index. And additionally, which index is the strongest one of, this, of these beams makes up the SSBRI or the SSB uh, index, essentially. Now, this is going to be the minimal feedback that our system will be relying on. And essentially, it is just the strongest beam index and the strongest RSRP from each user aggregated at the base station. So it's a very limited feedback format. This is only going to take on the order of tens of bits, as opposed to a full channel uh, feedback might be on the order of thousands of bits or more. So essentially, our problem statement boils down to this. We want to maximize the channel quality index that we, uh, that we are getting back, so maximizing the RSRP subject to the understanding that we don't want all the users to report the same beam, because then the, the following step, the, the attempt to transmit downlink data, can only be used to one user, um, or really one user for each beam selected. Um, so this doesn't uh, really help, and so the idea is we would like to have separate beams for the different users. Further, we want to cover the high density regions in particular. Um, in sub-6 gigahertz, there's not as much of a question whether or not uh, a UE will be able to receive a beam. So we're not as worried about optimizing the minimum, but rather we want to just achieve the strongest link we can. Now, we want a learning algorithm to be able to gather things like the user density, channel statistics, blockages, things like that, incorporate that all into a model that then projects or predicts uh, a subsequent code book to be used for initial access. So this brings us to our proposed solution, which we call the SSB encoder. And this is based on a neural network architecture. But first, we need to formulate the problem in a, uh, an informative way, and in particular in the beam space. So the key question to ask is, if the codebook were to change from one step to the next, how can you understand what the SSB index means? If beam 1 changes from step to step, then there's no un understanding of how what beam 1 being the strongest means. So instead, what we're going to do is we're going to convert the, the channel quality index, the RSRP, and the index to the beam space. So essentially, this is how we incorporate uh, domain knowledge into the neural network. What we're going to do is we know how the array response acts. And so we can project whatever beams are, are selected as the strongest beams for the users. We can identify the regions that those cover in a virtual space. And we can ignite these based on how strong the, uh, the channel quality index or the RSRP is. Now, one other kind of bookkeeping thing is we're going to be summing it up over all UEs that report the same beam. And the idea here is that we don't want our input dimension to change with the number of users, uh, because that would really break down the system and not be very usable. Whereas this allows us to always have a consistent uh, shape at both the output and the input, regardless of the number of users, which is really what we would like in initial access when you don't know how many users might respond. Furthermore, this, per, uh, this beam space observation, which we're going to call O here, is universal for any code book. If you change what, what a beam pattern looks like for any beam, it still translates to a consistent pattern um, in the observation. So this is a very powerful idea, and really is going to be the basis for our, our neural network architecture. So now here, we kind of outline two key properties of it. First, it's important to note that the dimensionality is quite large. If we have a massive MIMO array at the, at the base station, and we've got an observation that's, that's on the order of L max times that, and the, the, coder, the precoder, the code book, is also of that same size, this is a very high dimensional input and output. So we have to be very aware that, especially in a wireless domain where there's uh, very tight real-time constraints, we need to be careful of our neural network design. Furthermore, we actually have this very powerful inductive bias called shift equivariance. Essentially, what, we're, what this boils down to is if we have an observation that shifts to the right, uh, say, one grid space, then we would probably like our code book to do something similar. We should, we should see a, a corresponding shift, essentially. And this is the idea of shift equivariance. It doesn't necessarily have to be one-to-one -one or proportional. Um, but the idea is that the, a shift on one side causes a shift on the other. Now, all of this motivates the idea of using a convolutional neural network, and in particular, an encoder-decoder, because this will allow us to save parameters and isolate key features 
um, while also retaining that shift equivariance that is a very powerful inductive bias and is the baseline of a lot of uh, vision neural networks that have done very well um, throughout the last 10 years or so. Now, ultimately, uh, this encoder network is based on two uh, convolutional layers at the, at the encoder side and two convolution transpose, which is just the inverse operation at the decoder, plus one linear layer to handle any kind of scaling or bias uh, in the output. So this brings us to our, our data now, because we've got a neural network architecture, but as it's well known, machine learning requires a significant amount of data. So we're going to be using Quadriga channel model, um, which allows us to input various configurations, mobility patterns, and things like that, and output channel models. In particular, we're going to load this into a channel database, which will then be used later in another simulator that simulates the initial access simulation. So this is the idea that we want some users to stay consistent from one time step to the next, but we don't want uh, all users to always stay the same. So some users will drop in, some users will drop out, and we want to have control essentially over which time periods and which users are dropping in and out. So that's going to happen in the initial access simulator. But what will end up happening is a select number of channels will be drawn. We'll use a DFT codebook, project the beams, and obtain the feedback. Remember that limited feedback that is the, uh, the channel quality index, or again, that RSRP, and the corresponding beam index. And we're going to build up that observation space. And that's going to be stored as the input to our training database. And on the output, we're going to use the SVD beam formers. Now, the reason for this is because the channels are totally independent from each, or the, the beams transmitted and the RSRP is independent from one to the next. The best case, the optimal performance, if we're trying to maximize the reported RSRP, is going to be the SVD beam former to the LMAX strongest uh, eigen directions, essentially, or eigenvectors. So what we do is we take the SVD of each channel, we collect all of the um, eigenvalues, we determine which ones are the strongest, and then we collect the beam formers, which are the right eigenvectors uh, corresponding to those. Now, these are stored as the output. So essentially, what we're trying to do is we're training our neural network to take in the observation and output the SVD beam formers. Now, this actually works out quite well. In fact, here we show three different graphs. On the top right, we show the average RSRP for each number of user, or for each UE index. Um, corresponding to our case, which is the SSB encoder, that's our neural network, the DFT-8, which is an 8-beam codebook, the DFT-32, which is a 32-beam codebook, uh, corresponding to the case where perhaps you'd use a, a higher resolution or, or more beams, essentially, and the CSI SVD, which is if you had perfect channel state information and performed the SVD, which is essentially what we're training our neural network to try to do, how you would perform. You can see the gap is less than 4 dB in general, across, comparing ours to the, the CSI SVD case. Now, if you look at the lower right, you'll see that we actually, in if you average instead across all the users, and you look at it over time, you'll see that we, on average, over average 10 dB better than the 8-beam DFT codebook, which would be the standard practice to be used in this case. So that's a, a huge performance uplift. Um, and, and essentially, uh, we can actually also see that it's not just because a couple users are dominating or a couple beams are dominating. So in the DFT side, when you do eight beams, usually you'll do four that are in the main area of the cell and four that essentially target the cell edge. Um, and what that ends up doing is it forces the beam selection to be heavily dominated by just a couple of beams, essentially, where uniform selection would be a little bit more advantageous because it would mean that our users are selecting different beams more often. And so we can see that while our neural network is closer, there are a couple of beams that are selected um, much more often than other beams, um, which is OK. Um, but definitely the ideal uh, case, especially if, for later downlink transmission in a single stream case, would be that each user would select a different beam. So all told, what we can see here is that codebook design is really critical to optimizing the performance, especially in massive MIMO 5G. Uh, because it requires this beam training process that has very limited feedback. Furthermore, uh, if you translate the uh, feedback into this beam space, you actually can instill domain knowledge into the neural network and help really effectively learn codebook, uh, codebooks for, from machine learning. And finally, our results show that you can surpass the DFT codebooks by more than 5 dB, as much as 10 dB in the same uh, compared to an equal DFT codebook. So with that, I would just like to say thank you for your time.
and um, feel free to reach out if you have any questions. Thanks.